<laughs> Two years ago when I was a freshman at Lincoln University, I lived in the on-campus accommodation. It's a fairly standard, boring accommodation and relatively new in terms of when it was built. Basically nothing extraordinary. Anyway, our flat was a bit of a weird one. I was the girl at university whose boyfriend casually moved into the flat and I was very glad of it towards the end. I don't really remember exactly what the first thing that happened was, but there was always sounds like someone was walking above our rooms. We were the top floor apartment, hence why that's so odd. And the sound of keys, like the old fashioned big set of keys maintenance would have had, even though our flats had FOB keys and a universal key, so the maintenance man only ever had two keys. The sound of our front door of our flat opening, and then no one coming or going, etc. Little things like that. But the weirder things I do remember. I was incredibly ill for about a week, literally couldn't get out of bed most days, and so I slept a lot, and I remember waking up at 10am to a text from my flatmate asking me to be quiet as she could hear me laughing and shouting with my boyfriend having the best time of our lives. I was the middle room, she had the one next to the living room and my flatmates, let's just say were not the most social type, wouldn't have been in the living room. She was adamant she heard me and was a little shaken by this. A couple of nights later was November 5th and I was still so ill. It was 9pm and I could just hear the same Linkin Park songs on repeat my flatmate always listened to and the distinctive sound of her less than pleasant fake laugh. As I picked up my phone to text her and asked her to keep it down as I was so ill, I got a snapchat from her. She wasn't in her room but out watching fireworks. I swear, as soon as I saw the snapchat, all sounds just stopped. Fast forward to December 30th and everyone in the flat had gone home for Christmas. Before I go on, I must point out no one has a key to each other's rooms and I mean no one. I had a job and so had to commute to work over the holidays and was going to stay in the flat for one night to avoid the train. The second I opened the door into my room, I felt like I'd walked into a fog and my heart sank. The posters on my wall were all off and lying on the floor. Okay, they could have just fallen. The bunting, which had been pinned and hammered into the wall, was laying on a line on my bed. My shoes were out in pairs from under my bed. And my notice board where I kept my earrings hung in pairs. Clearly I'm very studious. The pairs were all jumbled up. My alarm clock was two meters away from where I kept it with the alarm set three hours wrong and the time set wrong too. Needless to say, I turned off the lights and I left. I sat at the train station for an hour before the next train home and as the train went past the apartment, the train line runs through the unit. I saw our living room light on. I immediately text all my flatmates and each said they were in their respective home cities. My boyfriend came back with me when I needed to come back for good, as the rest of the flat wouldn't be returning for a few weeks. I went on a night out with my friends back home, and so left him in my flat alone. He swears he heard my other flatmates talking about him, walking to each other's rooms, playing music, and generally slamming doors. He walked to the kitchen and saw one of their doors slightly ajar, and so I text him apologizing for him being there and explaining where I was. Her reply, that's okay, I'm not back until next Tuesday. So we went to recheck her door, and it was locked. Rather than a bathroom, we all had ensuite wet rooms, which often wouldn't dry as the door closed, and the extractor fan was permanently broken. My clever way of solving this was to hang the shower curtain over the door to keep the door from closing. This always worked, yet on numerous nights, both me and my boyfriend could hear the sounds of someone picking up the shower curtain and moving it as though the door shouldn't be open. Every time I had a shower, my boyfriend would swear he heard me talking to him and ignoring him at the same time. It was all very odd. 
Now, don't get me wrong. I know you're probably thinking that university, first year, alcohol was probably involved. And yes, I did drink and go out numerous times staying there. But most of the weirdest things happened when I was stone cold sober. I've even omitted stories from when I was intoxicated as I just can't be sure they were real. The one thing that probably shook me up the most was meeting a second year student and discussing where I lived with them to find out they once lived in my exact same flat, but the room across from mine. I still think the most unnerving thing was having the same experiences I've described, being asked of me as a have you heard the keys or someone walking above you or had things move just a few weeks before I was set to move out permanently. The whole thing still rattles me. And though we don't really always get along, as my flatmates and we rarely agreed on anything, we all agree that we more than likely did live in a haunted apartment, and that the guy in room one cannot hold his drink. I would like to share my story of what happened to me during my encounter with the paranormal. I always knock on wood when I say, Please show me a sign that everything is going to be okay. And that's where my story begins. My husband, my son age 3 and daughter age 1 and myself, lived one and a half miles in the woods. This was many years ago. My son is 16 now and my daughter is 12. I became sick and had a few financial issues I was concerned about. One day, I just said out loud, Please show me a sign that everything will be okay. Two days go by, and my husband and myself are watching TV around 11 o'clock. That is when I believe it all began. Our microwave that we had for a while made a noise, and the numbers were pushed to the start microwave at 5 minutes. We turn our heads to see the numbers going down, 459, 458, 457, and it keeps going. We stop it. I said, hmm. Maybe that was my sign that everything was going to be alright. I highly believed in the paranormal, in angels and spirits, so I brushed it off and we finished watching our show. The very next night, around the same time at night, we heard a faint knock at the front door. Mind you, our closest neighbor was a mile and a half away. Who was knocking at our door at 11 o'clock at night? My husband gets up and opens the door and no one was there. He walked outside, all around the house, and no one was outside. Our kids was sleeping during these two events. It began happening more and more, weird noises, lights turning on and off, and then I seen it for the very first time. I was taking a shower in a stand-up shower. The glass was shaded a bit white, but you could still see out of the glass. I turned around to rinse my hair out, and seen a man holding his hands next to his eyes, looking into the shower on the glass, as he would look, as if he were looking into a window. I screamed so loud, I was shaking. My husband had no clue what was wrong. He came running in, and I told him what happened, and I stood there with the shower door open and asked him to stand there and let me get the soap out of my hair. I was so afraid. That night went by, and I wouldn't leave my husband's side. Days were going by, and everything was still for a few days. We had a stereo that was hooked up to surround sound in our living room, and the volume button was a huge circle you turn up or down to control the volume. We were watching TV again one night, and watched the circle on the stereo move, and the volume went way up. My husband yelled, Okay, that's enough and we watched it move back down. It would turn up while I was on the phone, or if we were outside, we could hear it inside. I still have the same stereo to this day, and it has never done it again after those events occurred. I would smell a man's cologne that was very strong at times. It would come for a few seconds and then go. So I went to look and make sure one of my little ones didn't break a bottle of my husband's cologne somewhere, but nothing. Time kept going by, and again, one night, while we were sleeping, I woke up to use the restroom 
to see a shadow standing by my husband's knees on his side of the bed. I was so scared, I pulled the blanket up over my eyes and prayed for whatever it was to go away. It seemed as time would go by, things were becoming more of an issue. I would feel cold touches on my back and no one was there. I was so afraid during the days I would go visit my mother when my husband was working because I didn't want to be left at home alone with the kids and whatever it was at my house. I got Bibles and opened a Bible in each room and had it laying there and would read a verse each day. Then it seemed as time went by, it was slowly beginning to stop. I'd ask for whatever was there to please leave. It finally stopped and things were going back to normal and I did research on the land to see if something was wrong with their property. Coming across a ton of research, I found out that in the back part of our marked land, a man was killed in a hunting accident. I froze and could not believe it. So, to this day I say, if you do not believe, you have not had it happen to you. After four years, I ended up having another child. He was four years old and my mother passed away. My mother believed in the paranormal very much so and was just as interested in it as I was. My family was totally lost without her, so my family moved in with my father into the house that I grew up in and my mother passed away in. I remember having a conversation with my mom saying to her, if something happens to you, please let me know you're okay. She was very sick and was on dialysis and wasn't doing very well. She laughed and told me she would. She passed away on a Monday and I believe I got my first sign from her on a Wednesday. I was at the doctor's and received a ticket with the number 21 on it. That was the day she passed away. Leaving the doctor's, her song was on the car on the radio and I came to a red light and the car in front of me had a sticker on it that said, in memory of mom. Right then and there, I cried and knew she was okay. What were the chances of me being behind that car at that moment? Very odd. We are living in my parents' house to this day. My father moved into a smaller house and odd things started happening here. I would see a shadow walking up and down the hall. I would see a shadow in the kitchen and see it in all the spots she would be when she was here. My little one grew up and was three years old when he started to tell me he was seeing May May in the house. That was what my other two kids called my mom when she was here. He didn't know who she was. He was only four months old when she passed. He's eight years old now and still sees her and tells me what she says. He has validated things that only my mother and myself knew. So I knew my little one was seeing her. I believed it. So I tell him not to be afraid of her. She is here to visit to look after him and his brother and sister. There are many, many more stories I can share about my child when it comes to our house now, but I can share that at another time. I used to be afraid, but I'm much better now. I have an angel looking over my family. This story takes place back when I was around 17 to 18. I am now 33 years of age. It all began with my brother Shane and his obsession with a Ouija board we owned at the time. We bought the board more for me since I was the big Ouija freak, but somehow I ended up using a lot less than everyone else. My mom wouldn't even touch it, fearing something evil would happen, but my kids couldn't help keep their hands off of it. You know how teenagers are, defiant and ignorant. My brother Shane, sister Misty, our cousin Christy and I would sit down and play with the board. Lots of times we were acting silly, laughing as we played. I guess we figured they were fake and not much to them. I wish I had been right, but as it turns out, I was more wrong than I had ever imagined. As these little get-togethers on weekends went by, most of us became less interested in playing with the Ouija and more interested in other things. However, Shane had an obsessive thought that he wanted to investigate. He wanted to see if the board would work with only him touching the planchet. I warned him not to do it, 
But of course, he didn't listen. Shane found out after about two or three times that the board worked with just him playing it. It was slow at first, but the more he played with it, the faster the planche would move and spell out answers. These sessions served to only draw Shane deeper into his fascination with the Ouija board. Furthermore, he would spend hours by himself with the board. He started to withdraw and became antisocial. The Ouija became his best friend, or should I say, his only friend. He would sit in his room, door closed for hours on end, even missing meals. Only one thing mattered in his life, the Ouija board. We tried talking to Shane, telling him to put away the board and come out and hang out with us. I even tried putting the Ouija back in its box and hiding it, but he'd wait until I was asleep and hunt it down. My mom threatened to burn it if he didn't stop playing with the Ouija, but he was undaunted. Up until this point, it was still just a game to me, albeit a game that my brother was obsessed with. However, things were about to change as Shane would turn our normal family life into a nightmare. It began with him saying that he could see a woman in white moving around the house, especially at night. He said the woman spoke to him and she would tell him things. We asked him about the conversations and he would only say that the woman was disappointed or angry at such and such. He saw her as a friend until the night she appeared, looking like she was ready to hurt someone. At that point, I was very jittery and threatening to burn the board myself. Whatever spirit Shane was talking to from the Ouija was obviously playing with his head and starting to show itself in our home. The problems began to escalate on the night my brother told me that he had dreams of killing us and was contemplating actually falling through with it. I told my mom and we started locking our bedroom doors at night. It was then when we heard the knocking began. We started hearing knocking on the windows and doors late at night. It was as if someone was beating the heck out of the front door. I started praying until it would stop. The next time, the Ouija spirit appeared as a man. It began with a faint whistling, like someone whistling a song. Of course, we all checked with each other and nobody in the house was whistling. At night, it would get louder and louder. I could now distinguish that it was definitely a man. In fact, we began to call him Mr. Whistleman. We had told a few close friends, but no one really believed us. That is, until the night my friend Jill was over and experienced what we had been dealing with. Jill was so freaked out that she made me sit up all night with her until her dad could pick her up the next morning. We couldn't get away from Mr. Whistleman as he even followed us on vacation. As I discussed the problems with Shane and what I thought was a safe haven, it was Mr. Whistleman who heard us talking about him and suddenly we'd hear all the whistling. Our nerves were constantly on edge at home and the tension was so thick that even a sword couldn't have cut it. The constant knocking as well as the whistling and Shane's weird moods were wearing on the rest of my family. My mother and I decided that we had enough and were positive that the root of the problem was the Ouija board. We agreed that it felt as though the problems were escalating and as soon as it would be an all-out war, but at the moment, neither of us saw any light at the end of the tunnel. Strangely enough, it was soon after that discussion that the Ouija board spirit turned into some sort of poltergeist. On one occasion, my sister ran screaming from a back bedroom, saying something tried sitting on the bed. She had been in there napping when she heard what she insisted was the sound of heavy cloven feet coming towards the bed. Then, she felt as if someone or something was sitting down and putting pressure on her. Needless to say, she was terrified. My mom was scared too and I didn't help matters as I went into panic mode. This thing had already gone after Shane and Misty. Now I was convinced that I was next. In fact, I didn't have to wait too long to find out. It was after midnight of the following night and everyone was asleep. I suddenly awoke from a nightmare to see my brother sitting on his bed looking at me. I asked him what he was doing 
and he said he awoke to see a black shadow with its arms pointed towards me. Apparently, it was then when the shadow noticed him and vanished. So many questions raced through my mind as I struggled to make sense of it all. What was this thing? Why was it after me and my family? Was this ever going to end? It felt as if the spirit was playing with us, like we were its personal toys. It would appear without warning and take on various forms. It was constantly rummaging through the house, unnerving us with all the noise, especially at night. We were exhausted from lack of sleep and always on alert, wondering when and where the next appearance would be. Then came the night it talked to us. More specifically, it spoke directly to me. I'd been talking to Shane, just making conversation, and we got into a disagreement. Suddenly, I heard a voice, plain as day, angrily growl at me. Leave him alone, it said. It was as plain as if another person had been standing right there with us. My biggest fear was that this entity would possess my brother, but had other prey in mind. My sister Misty was the target now. One night, my sister hadn't been feeling too good. She went to lie down on the couch, and it seemed like she was sick. Suddenly, she made an odd request. She wanted me to remove my Bible from the couch before she would lie down. I asked why, and she said she had the urge to throw it or rip out pages. Well, I felt an urge of my own as I grabbed the Bible and put it against her forehead. Misty started screaming and cursing. Foam was coming out of her mouth, and she threatened to kill. She used language I'd never heard come out of her mouth before, profane and blasphemous things. My mom held her while I held the Bible to her head and prayed out loud. After what seemed an eternity, she finally began to subside. Afterwards, she was completely confused as she asked what we were doing to her. We knew we had to do something immediately, so we ran out into the middle of the street. It was well after midnight as we tried to find someone with a phone. We were all worn out and scared and definitely not wanting to go back into the house. My dad wanted to take us all and just leave, but we were afraid the thing would just follow us wherever we went. Somehow, we had to fight this thing and we knew we couldn't do it alone. At this point, we called our pastor, David, last name omitted, and his wife, Patty. They were a Pentecostal preaching husband and wife. I knew they believed in demons and spirits, as there had been many times at church when they explained to us how they turned their lives towards the Lord after dealing with some dark times, including an encounter with demons. We explained what was going on, and they said they'd be there the next day. When they arrived, they instructed us to stay outside as they went in and attempted to clear the house. Although they weren't exactly sure what they would be dealing with, their preference was for us to be safely away from what they thought would be a demon. Of course, we were fine with standing on the sidelines cheering them on. In other words, we were so terrified that we had no intention of even stepping onto the welcome mat outside. After it was over, we asked them what they had seen. They told us they had seen something bad, but wouldn't say what it was. Maybe they didn't want to scare us, I don't know. I do know that the house felt lighter, and I was so happy to have it leave my family alone. Shane hasn't touched on their Ouija board, since my mother has forbidden having anything of that nature in her home. To this day, I still wonder about that experience, and if we all are truly safe from the evil that presides within the Ouija board. Yo, it's my phantom crew, ready to back me up with some comments in the comments section below. Yo, I'm hip, so I hippity hop the hip song hop, right? Whatever that means. You know, guys, thank you so much for tuning in once again for this nice September edition of Haunted Ghost Stories. Ah, yep, but that's kind of a contradiction. Well, that's not really a contradiction. What the hell am I saying? Anyway, guys, no, seriously. 
Uh, please comment, like, and subscribe below. I'm not going to edit out this intro because, you know, I feel like I'm more genuine when I don't edit it out. And it just makes me seem real because, you know, as a phantom, as a ghost, you know, you want to believe that, you know, ghosts are real and they're talking to you. So at least I'm the only YouTuber who's a ghost who actually can, you know, narrate and, you know, make videos for you guys. So that's pretty cool. Ow, I just hit my head. I actually meant to say I hit my hand, but whatever. See, like I said, I'm not perfect. Anyway, guys, you have to share this because I'm imperfect and... It probably will help me out before, you know, I lose my sanity. So just, you know, go ahead and share the video if you like. Better yet, let me know in the comments section below what you're so excited about for this Halloween season. I mean, is it the new It movie that you guys are interested in? Yeah, you know, that'd be cool. But anyway, guys, I'll see you later. Good night, good morning, and I will see you in the next video. Waving my precious little phantom hands at you.